bless you as you hand up punish your spirit leading and guide this father as we've said it's a privilege and honor to be here in the house of the living god as we truly are the temples of the holy ghost father we're grateful tonight father we thank you father for you tonight for your love your mercy your grace we thank you for who you are father and who we are in and through christ jesus who you gave for us we are redeemed from sickness we are redeemed from poverty and we're redeemed from spiritual death we thank you in christ jesus we have eternal life tonight we have the abundant life father jesus came to give life and life abundantly and father tonight in a sense we're just having a reading of the will this last will and testament the better covenant based upon better promises now father i believe the people in this place come just as i have tonight by faith expecting to receive something from you i know by the spirit of god they know as well you're endeavoring to take us to a place concerning spiritual things greater than we've ever been where there's greater anointing <coughs> greater glory greater presence and father we thank you many of these things we already possess is present possessions in Christ Jesus. Our health and healing, Father, is a present possession, but we have to learn what is rightfully ours. So I just thank you, Father, that tonight as the word goes forth and they receive it by faith, they're going to receive that rainbow word. It's a rainbow, a revelation, a seeing and a knowing. Hey, that belongs to me. That's mine tonight, Father. They're going to receive it and apply it and go out here and be changed forever, never to be the same again. Now I have my notes by the Spirit of God. Of course, they're in line with the Word. But, Father, there's only one which is you that knows the state of every heart and life of the people under the sound of my voice. I thank you tonight as I open my mouth. It will not be man's plans, thoughts, or ideas, but it will be what thus saith the Holy Spirit in and through the Word of God. And I thank you I'll just be that vessel, just yield it to you. And I thank you now, Father, as we just move over into this part of the service. We're teaching and preaching at your instruction. The ministry of Jesus was that of teaching, that of preaching, and he also went about healing. We are to preach the gospel first and foremost, but it's to be confirmed with signs following. And we just thank you tonight, Father. Yes, it's not only through faith, but it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. We want everything just like that. But, Father, we just thank you that our faith is increasing, that it's being built. And as we go out and apply it, it's being exercised and it's growing. So we can walk in those places and be those men and women of God greater than ever before to be the witnesses in this earth for you, Father, and to walk in the fullness of the blessings in Christ Jesus. Father, just lead God and direct us now. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives in this place. And we thank you the last amen in these lives. Here tonight will be changed, challenged, and honored forever. Never to be the same again, but above all else, everything that's said and done will give you the glory, honor, and praise you so deserve. We count these things done by faith right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. The children can be dismissed at this time. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for all the provision for the body of Christ, really for the world if they receive it, but for the body of Christ if we will learn what's ours and walk in it. God is with us. Go to Luke 13. I'm not going to read all these every week, but I've just got a few different passages and we'll kind of we want them to get down and your faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Dr. Hagin used to always say it comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. It's because you heard something one time don't mean that you know it. But if you hear it long enough, it would be a light bulb just goes off. Illumination, revelation will take place. You receive it as yours. You can walk in it. Years back, and I can see it just as good as if it was today or right now, because I wrote it by the Holy Ghost on my board years ago. The Holy Spirit told me this, and it goes along with what we're talking about. He said, the only reason that my people, Christians, are weak in any area of their life is one of two reasons. Either they don't have the Word on the subject, or either they're not doing the Word that they have. He said, the only reason that Christians, my people, are weak in any area of their life is one of two reasons. Either they don't have the Word on the subject. You know, faith begins where the will of God is known. You can't walk in anything that you don't know is rightfully yours. That's why I tell you all the time, people take it lightly and I don't mean anything by it, but church is life or death for you. I said it can be life or death for you. You can receive a Word today that you need in due season. It might be next week, month, or year, but it's a Word that you need. And you've got to be where God placed you to receive it. A lot of times people lightly esteem 
God's direction, His instruction. Even in the Word, they can't understand why things happen. We have to be serious about the things of God. Not as serious, but more serious than everything else in your life. Because nothing's more important than your relationship with God. You cannot walk out His will, plan, or purpose that you do not know. Right? Reality is, one of your best friends needs to be your Bible. And I know it's Jesus. But your Bible must be important to you. This is the words that we live by. Last time I'll say it, he said, the only reason that my people, Christians, are weak in any area of their life is for one of two reasons. And I'm not reading this. It's in my spirit. He said, number one, because they don't have the Word. You can't walk in the light you don't have. And number two, they're not doing the Word that they have. It doesn't work just because you know it. It only works when you do it. And all of us that's walking in the blessings of God, including myself, have found that out mm -hmm. by experience. Right? You can know God's plan for your marriage. That's great. You can tell other people, but if you don't go home and do it, it won't change anything. You can know God's financial plan and say, man, this thing is awesome. But if you choose not to do it, it won't work for you. Right? Luke 13, y'all there? Verse 10. We read this last week. This is one of the ones that we'll look at on, on occasion here. Verse 10. He was teaching, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. On the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. She couldn't help herself. She's in a bad way, and it wasn't for just a few days. You say, I've been dealing with such and such for all these years. It's all right. Jesus will and can still heal you, still set you free. You can still be delivered if you've been bound. People sometimes just accept stuff. Don't accept the devil's mess in your life if you've been dealing with it for 30 years. Amen. Don't accept it. Amen? It's not of God. If it's not of God, don't accept it. You say, oh, this just comes down through my family. That's why you need to be in church. You say, I got this from my daddy. I thought you had a new daddy. Amen. You got a new father. Yes. You got a new family. Yes. Amen? Amen? And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. It's all the same message, but it glorifies God when we walk in divine health and healing. It glorifies God not when you are attacked by sickness or disease of any sort, but when you apply the Word and receive God's best. And you come out on the other side. You're able to tell people what God has done for you. It glorifies God. You may face all kinds of battles and different things. You may get in sickness and disease or other areas and you trust God and He sees you through. That glorifies God when you walk in victory. Amen? Amen? Need to be found applying the Word because the Word works, but only if you work it. And the rule of the synagogue 14 answered with the indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. Said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. And then therefore come and be healed not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered him, said, Thou hypocrite, does each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him to the water, to water him? And on not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. These need to be marked in your Bibles. I got a Bible, I got other stuff marked up in, in this passage, but it needs to be marked. Those four words, whom Satan hath bound. Lo, these 18 years he loosed, excuse me, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. But he talked about this woman that had this spirit of infirmity for 18 years, both together, and could in no wise lift herself up. But in verse 16, he plainly says it was behind him. And it's the same one that's behind all sickness and disease. Behind all cancer, behind all tumors, behind all blood disease, behind from common cold to incurable cancer, the same one's behind them all. Amen. And we have to have that revelation if we have nothing else, because as I've told you repeatedly, if you ever see Jesus or God the Father, as your afflictor, you'll never receive Him as your healer. There's no hope. You're off to the worst start possible. Say, God had a purpose in it. That's wrong. That's not true. God had no purpose in it. It's the work of the devil. All of it is the work of the devil. You say, I don't understand. Stay in church. Stay under the Word. I, I personally believe, and, and I could be wrong because I'm, I'm human and convinced. I believe we've got better messages on healing than on what I'm teaching on. So this is where the Lord told me to start. So this is where we're going to start. And we're going to stick with it. And we're going to stay with the Word. Amen?
I pray the same way for every single service as I do every day. Lord, what would you have me to do? And again, I would feel that I had a better message, but he said, no, this is where I want you to start. We've been talking about this in just the second week, the origin of sickness and disease. But like I told you last week, we really could add to that. Say the origin of sickness and disease in the church. Because the church isn't supposed to be sickly and afflicted. But one of the questions that problems and problems that believers have is, is you cannot hardly you know, distinguish between the church and the world anymore on any area, including sickness and disease. The coronavirus showed this up. It just showed it just as plain as day that there was really none, not 1%, but hardly no difference between the world and the church in response, reaction, decisions, or anything else. What the world did, the church did. And I know a lot of Christians think that's right, but they don't read their Bible. Amen? Now we want the meat of God's Word. A lot of these things might hurt. A lot of these things might slice you up. But it's kind of like surgery in the natural. You got something wrong and you go to the doctor and they need to do surgery. Most people in the right mind don't look forward to getting cut naturally. But if you choose that path and you have surgery, you already know you've got some form of recovery, but that surgery that takes place, if it does what it's supposed to do in the natural, there is a surgery that takes place. There might be some incisions, removal or whatever, but it's not for your worse, it's for your benefit. Right? If you come over to the things in the Word of God, if you only pick out just what you like or makes you feel good, you'll never walk in God's best. There's some slicing and dicing that's necessary for you to be. In line with the Word. Thank God for encouragement and exhortation in the Word of God. We need them. God tells me to preach a message tonight. God loves you. To ensure you know that, I preach it all day. I preached it before. But we need to understand where we may be missing it so we can stop missing it and walk in God's best. And I kind of double, triple down on this because the Lord gave me an awakening by the Spirit of God. He didn't tell me to stop praying. He didn't tell me, tell me to stop trusting Him. But we've been believing God for a move of God. A great and mighty move of God. And we thought just because we're praying, which is a part of it, that it's automatically going to take place. And people say, well, if you walk by faith, but I'll get there later, maybe not even tonight. There's no such thing as faith without obedience. You'll find out when you set your faith for anything and you get serious with God, it shouldn't come as a surprise, but you'll go, He'll go to help you examine your life. He'll start showing you things. Is that to hurt you? No. You set your faith. You believe this thing. You're confessing God, confessing and believing. You believe you're going to receive it, but there may be things in your life that's hindering it. The Holy Spirit showing you those things not to hurt you, but to address the hindrances from you receiving what God's promised you. And He's told me about the move of God, laying hands on the sick and they recover. People say, well, just go ahead and do it. That's fine. We will do that. It's already laid out in the Word. But concerning the move of God, we thank God. Those signs follow them that believe and they follow the preaching of these got the gospel. And the Lord said, if you're going to walk in my best, you're going to have to first preach the word and teach the word. And my people are going to have to get back to doing the word and living the word. If you pay attention today, and I won't get off on this, but the majority of the body of Christ don't even know what the gospel is anymore. That's not even what church is about. I believe we should pray, listen, and obey and do it God's way. This is the best. Yes. Amen. Some people's too smart for their own good. You need a revelation, and so do I, that thank God for all of the things we are in Christ Jesus, but outside of Christ and without Him, we have nothing. Yes. Going nowhere to accomplish nothing. And that's a revelation that we need. We're going to get there in just a minute, but I was reading this morning in the Wigglesworth Standard again by Smith Wigglesworth. And he'd be called telegrams and all kinds of stuff, letters to go to different places. People were bound, sickness and disease, bound by the devil and all such things. And they said that there were times, even when it was urgent, that he, this wasn't every time, but he said there were times when it was urgent that before Wigglesworth would go to pray for somebody, he would stop everything he was doing and get in his prayer closet and take communion by itself to make sure he was emptied of himself and he was dependent fully on Jesus to go set somebody free. Now we just say, go do it. No, we need to be fully dependent. We need to be standing on the Word and know what the Word says. Right? But it says, whom Satan hath bound. Satan is behind all sickness and disease. Been looking at three main points, and this will not be in one service, it will be throughout. Sickness and disease is of the devil, number one. Number two, we will see through redemption. We're going to get there for sure. God has made provision. For our health through Jesus. 
and the plan of redemption, and then of course how we receive it is number three, is by faith. We must receive the truth of God's Word and see sickness and disease for what they are. They are of who? The devil, Satan. Sickness and disease are offspring. Dr. Hagen talked about this a lot. They're the offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother, sin. As a child of God, this is not part of mine or yours inheritance. It's actually part of the curse you've been redeemed from. Amen? And many ask, and I wrote this down, I've read it almost several times here. If health and healing is God's will, why are so many sick in the body today? Well, I just say, like Dr. Hagen always said, one of my favorite things he said, when we have questions, the Bible has answers. So we'll go to 1 Corinthians 11 again. We'll look at some of these things. You know, a lot of things happen spiritually, and when they take place, if we're not in tune with the Spirit, we don't even realize what happened. It happens regularly. We'll look at, for sake of time, 1 Corinthians 11. We know what they were doing. We covered all this last week. But I'm not going to go back through all of it. You remember the Corinthians were saved. They were Spirit-filled. We went just a little bit further. We know they had the gifts of the Spirit in operation. We know they Spirit-filled because they was praying in tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We had Paul trying to straighten it out. So these weren't people that there was a devil out here in the street that, that Paul was talking to. He's talking to the church that was out of order. Right? And then we know that they had the rich and they had the poor and you, they were coming together and had classes. And, and when I say classes, I mean lower, middle, and upper classes. That kind of classes. And then they were, you know, the, the, we had, they had some doing without when they was taking the Lord's Supper and some was getting drunk. And, and you know, and all these kind of things. And Paul's correcting them. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, I have received of the Lord. He received this by revelation. He wasn't there with Jesus <coughs> back in the with the other disciples. Which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. When He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also He took the cup, which when He had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do you as oft as you drink it, and remember of me. And He's talking about the better covenant based upon better promises, his signs still delivered in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and the price He paid, the blood that was shed, right? Are you redeemed tonight? Yes. yes. Do you know what that means? Yes. If you don't, we're going to get into it. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until He come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And that's what they were doing. They were being careless and they will be in irreverent. I'm not going to get off on it right now, but if you pay attention among most Christians and in the body of Christ today, carelessness and irreverent is very prominent. Nothing matters. <coughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I haven't said anything about this because I don't really have an interest and I don't care. But you see a lot of the, here recently, what was last Sunday, this past Sunday, was the Super Bowl. And they had the Super Bowl, it was a halftime show. Right? And you have Christians, Christians, not just people in the world, that's fussing and fighting over the halftime show, how great it was. You say, what do you think? It's an abomination to God. And you have to be ignorant to think it was anything but an abomination to God. When you defend as a Christian, a born-again, spirit-filled believer, gyrating half-naked, using words that go directly against the God-ordained authorities, mocking officers and all this kind of stuff, which is blatant sin. Immorality, which is blatant sin. I don't care what area you come out of and what was your music. I thought you got saved. But so the Christians will do that kind of mess and when bad stuff happens in their life, God, why did you do this? You can't even smell God. And you don't care nothing about Him. You know, God gets a lot of blame for stuff He's got nothing to do with. God doesn't make yours and mine decisions. We do. And the churches got over with the world, took all responsibility and personal accountability and chunked it in the trash. You can't do that. It's a serious business. It's a life or death stuff. The church that takes the mentality that nothing matters, anything's out what happened to them. Because that's how you open the door for the devil. And we should never be shocked if we open the door for the devil and he comes in. Because he's going to do it every time. Amen? 
Now some of the preaching and teaching we're going to be doing, you say, well, we're getting back, we're going backwards. No, we're going backwards. A lot of the things that has been, is not in the church today, present in the church today, was left off when God didn't tell anybody to leave it off. People started complaining, I don't like this, and the preacher don't love me. That's not true. The Bible says, whoever loves you will tell you the truth. It's in love, but it's the truth. It's only the truth that will set you free. The very moment we sacrifice and forfeit for any reason, people's feelings or anything, the truth of God's Word, you forfeit any ability for God to use you as a vessel to change you. That's why a lot of times people's own family can't help them. Because in the name of love, they're enablers and they compromise. So I love them too much to tell them the truth. I love my children too much to correct them. That's exactly the opposite of the Bible says. Amen? The Bible says if you love them, you'll correct them. It's proof that you don't love them if you don't correct them. You don't care enough to obey the Word. Amen? Y'all need to start dancing, right? <laughs> no, it's the truth of God's Word anyways. And then again, this is, I'm, I'm more sure of these things than I've ever been before. That's why we're moving into them. Because it's the Word. And the Lord said, if you want this move of God, I got, a, I got a CD. I can't count the times I've listened to it. I don't even know where I got it from. But it's Dr. Hagen. And the title is Man and Miracles. Man and Miracles. He says it numerous times throughout. I can just hear it in my head. But he goes to talking about some of the things that's going to return to the body of Christ that the body of Christ might not want. There's going to be a dealing with some things by the Spirit of God. Because there's things in the church. This has been going on for the last several years here. Not even just here, but ever. There's things in the church that are hindering the move of God that many in the church are praying for. So there's had to be a great separation and division because everybody can't go in. Well, they could, but they don't want to. If we choose a way that's other than God, that's contradictory to His plan, they can be removed and set over here and set over there. It's, it's not God's will, but it's, it happens all the time. Amen? So let's go on down. Any of these things you got questions on, just wait and see. You'll get them answered. You say, Pastor, you know everything. No, but I know the Word. And I do understand some things along these lines. Because the Lord's taught me through the Word and by the Spirit. And I've seen it happen repeatedly. As I said, I've seen things happen before that the Holy Spirit told me. And I knew what was going on. And everybody around was asking, why, 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 why? Well, again, when you have questions, the Bible has answers. And God has all the answers. Now, I can't tell you everything because I don't know everything. God don't tell me everything. But it is true there's a reason for everything that happens. It's just not usually the reason people think it is. Most people just say, there's a reason, there's a reason for everything. Man, that's, that's deep. Wow. I'm not talking. You have to pay you big money. Yeah, there is a reason for everything. But everybody don't want to hear the reason. Amen? So, where'd I stop? Y'all remember? We get to 27? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Who careless and irreverent. But let a man examine himself. And this should be a daily thing. <clears throat> Not just at church or when we're preaching this message. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation, which is judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And that was our main focus. Not discerning the Lord's body. That was the reason that they had these next things going on. We know it was the reason because the next phrase says, what? For this cause. Right? For this cause. Many are weak and sickly. Among you and many sleep. Now, I mean, this is cause and effect. It's just as plain as day. In the body of Christ, in the church, save spirit-filled believers, because they did not rightfully discern the Lord's body. They did not take serious things as serious. They were careless and irreverent about things they should have been reverent. It's kind of mocked today that there's hardly no fear of the Lord in the church. Well, it opens the door for the devil. Amen? You know, just one little example, but it's just so blatant. That thing with the halftime show, Christians. Christians defending that. I mean, just shocking. Plum shocking. So I just thought it was awesome. You need to get saved or repent, one or the other. I mean, you get two choices, one or the other. Or either keep going that way, that's, a, that's not good. Amen? But when somebody has that mentality and that low of a standard, well, it opens the door for the devil in their life. He said, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. 
and many sleep. So, let's move along. Because we're about to where we were last week. So we finally get started. For this cause, because they did not properly discern, discern the Lord's body, the Lord's body was Jesus Christ, Christ the healer, by his stripes we were healed. These things were present in their lives and in their church. The origin of sickness and disease we know and sin is, is sin and Satan himself. We were created to live and not die. Right? And, and when we talk about sin, this is a little bit further, not too much deeper, but there's two ways sin can disrupt God's best. We can say two ways that you can sin. Most people know the first one that we're talking about, which is sins of commission. It's things that you do that you shouldn't do. But a lot of times, and I've got in trouble in this area in, in times past, and God's had to correct me on it, is sins of omission that other people around you might not know nothing about. But God's told you to do things, and you hadn't done it. That's just as much a sin as a sin of commission. But a lot of people just let that ride because God's placed something in your heart and said do it, and you just, for whatever reason, keep pushing it aside. I've been in these situations even several years back. The Lord, it was something that God had told me to do and it had been a couple years and I, I could take you back to the place that I was at. He said, listen, this is what I told you to do. He said, and you've gone as far as you can without it costing you. You say, what else did He have to say? What else did He say? He didn't have to say nothing else. I knew what He's talking about. By the Holy Ghost. He had placed something in my heart and I had pushed it off as long as I could because I didn't want to do it anyways. It was the truth about it. I didn't want to do it. But I just kept pushing it off. And he told me that morning. Again, I could take you right back to the place. He said, listen. He said, you've let it go just as long as you can without it costing you. Do it now or it's going to cost you. He said, what you do? We did it. Amen? It pays to obey and it costs to disobey. And thank God he's merciful. We won't get there tonight, but we went over to Revelation 3, I believe. We saw Jezebel. He said, I gave her a space of time to repent. God's merciful even when you miss it. He'll give you space and give you time to make adjustments. But if we refuse God's directions and His corrections, as we'll see, if we refuse those things, it's costly. So we've had a false love come into church and there's no, there's no discipline, there's no correction. That's not the gospel. That's not correct. It's not accurate. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira. They'll tell you about it. Amen? And I said this last week, I believe, but many say, well, when sickness and disease comes, you say, well, what about this situation? No, we're not going there, but if we went over to John and we looked at and we looked at Thomas, what did Thomas say to Jesus or about Jesus? He said, if I see it, I'll believe it. My own experience. But, but Jesus said that His Word is truth. Abraham received the promise, believed it, right? And he had the fruit thereof. We do not trust God based on your experience or anybody else's. Our faith in God is in His Word. What has He said? There can be no ifs, ands, or buts about it or there's no faith. Right? Many say, well, if it's my time, what if God needs me in heaven? Well, God's trying to teach me something. And in reality, that's the sin of doubt and unbelief, forfeiting God's best for your life because it's an excuse why God won't do what He said He would do. I, I don't know everything. Do you? We've had different situations in the church. You know, and, and again, it doesn't have to be sins of commission. It doesn't have to be things that people do wrong. And I'm going to use this, and I don't think Jonathan will be offended with me using it. One of the examples that I don't know about. Jonathan lost on this side there in heaven. He lost his mom and his daddy when it was a space of how many months? Like six months. Six months, not a lot. But six months. And I can't imagine how that would feel and what he dealt with. But I remember his mama. When his mama went on to be with the Lord. I don't know anybody that that didn't shop. And many can say, well, it was just her time, her, her flowers in the garden, all this kind of stuff. I don't believe that stuff's biblical. And, and they have said things that, of course, I didn't even know about because that was his mama. Not mine, although we love Miss Karen. But people could ask me, well, why did Miss Karen leave here but before she was a I can't answer all those things because I don't know everything. I could assume some things, and I know from even being out here at the church, I know that she was dealing with some things physically that may have been more serious than what she thought. I don't know that. I mean, I, and they said, well, Mama should have went to the doctor or this, that, or the other. I don't know that personally. I don't know all of those reasons, although I know she was dealing with some things. 
But just to not know, can I tell you, if the Holy Spirit was dealing with Miss Karen and said, you need to believe God about this, or, or this is going to happen, and I'm talking about physical things, not her in sin, but believe in God for him, I don't know, or you need to go to the doctor, and then Jonathan, Ethan, everybody tell her, and she didn't listen, so she graduated to heaven. I can't tell you that, because I don't know. But I can say from the Bible that it's not God's will that any of us leave here sick and diseased. Any of us. But at the same time, the glory that we take is we don't have any question whether Miss Karen's in heaven or not. We know that. If she believed the Lord Jesus Christ, no question. And we wish she was still here. There's many others that I could use and there's different times that I may have the answer. But there's going to be times when you don't know everything. God hasn't told me anything about that. So I don't have all the answers. I haven't tried to make anything up to Jonathan. He's sitting here in the tape. I don't know everything. But I do know what the Word says. I know, just like with my dad, when he left here 49 years old, and he was a faith and healing teacher and preacher, and laid hands on the sick and they recovered, I know when he left here 49 years old, without a doubt, that that wasn't God's best. I wouldn't fight with anybody that tried to fuss and fight with me. I can read. We're promised in line with the Word 70 to 80 years until we're satisfied. And the reality of it is, when things go another way, that's not God's best for anybody. We have to receive that not because many of us have been through different experiences, but because our faith is in God's Word. You can't say, I trust God, but I don't understand because this happened to so-and-so. You've got to have faith in one or the other. Not both. Now he knows I'm not saying nothing bad about his mama. Primary reason is, because I don't have nothing bad to say about her. I don't know nothing bad about her. I thought she was a, a woman of God. And we loved her dearly. Amen? But after daddy died at 49 years old, a faith and healing preacher and teacher laid hands on the sick, they recovered. I took consolation. It wasn't this Bible, my date's Bible I got at the house. I remember it laying on my desk after the funeral and everything, and I went back to work. One of the things the Lord impressed upon my spirit is He said, always remember, son, that word reads the same way after your daddy left here as it did before. Your faith doesn't change because of what happened to somebody else. It can't. That's how vicious cycles and different things happen in, in families. I know what the Bible says, so it doesn't matter how many times that the enemy has come and said, you know, you're 44, you're 45 now, you're this old, your daddy thought he's going to live to be 80 or 90. He thought the same thing. Well, I don't think I know. Matter of fact, i got a number picked out. I've watched these guys. I'm going to pray about it when I get there, but if I'm not mistaken, I know what was worth. He left here when he was 86. Dr. Hagen died when he was 86. I think that's a good number to pray and talk to God and see if we want to stay longer when we get there. <coughs> Amen? So you don't have any control over that. That's what's happened to the church. When you believe that, anything can happen. When you just throw this thing open and say whatever happens is God's will, that's one of the most dangerous things you can do. The Bible says to resist the devil. Submit yourselves unto God and resist the devil and he'll flee. You'll not resist the devil if you don't know it is the devil. Right? Now we already showed you from the Bible, sickness and disease is of the devil. You say, what happens when this comes and this happens in my house and all of this? Stand against it. Stand on the Word and overcome it. Don't accept it. For this cause, many are weak in verse 30. Many are weak, many are sickly, and many sleep. Right? Yes, and as I said earlier, there's always a reason, but that doesn't mean that it has come from God or it's his, it is His plan. Why is that so important? Because if you don't understand who and what is behind your sickness or disease, it's really not yours, it's the devil's. And it just it sticks with you. It might not. I hope it sticks with you. But she was a, a medical doctor, Lillian B. Yeomans. Dr. Hagen studied behind her. Mighty woman of God. She was a medical doctor, and then she got saved and spirit filled. And she was a dynamic teacher on faith and healing. And and I wasn't there, obviously. But they said one of the things she'd do when she's teaching healing, she would ask them, "How many of you, you know, have sickness and disease in your life?" They say, "You know," and they say, "I have a cold." You know, I have a sore throat, or I have this, and I have that. 
And she said, that's fine, you can keep it as long as you claim it. That's what she told her. She said, you can keep it just as long as you claim it. See, what do you mean by that? If you realize it comes from the devil and it's of him, you'll not claim it as yours. It's not your sickness. It's not your coronavirus. It's the devil's. Amen? So i got people, I'm not talking about people in your life. I'm, I'm saying, what are you going to do with the Word? We're at church tonight. I wouldn't preach this message 99 times out of 100 if I was at a funeral today. That's not the crowd to preach this to. And it'll benefit the person that's graduating. Hopefully to heaven, none. They're already gone. But you need this because you're still here. Right? you still got to live on this side. Many are weak. I don't know that you have time to write these down. But many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. That word weak is 772 in the Greek and is strengthless. Feeble. It means helpless and without energy. Do you know there's even a spirit of slumber today that you have to be careful about? Weak is strengthless, feeble, helpless without energy. That's how many were in the church. You get around Christians sometimes, they can't even always stand up. Amen? It shouldn't be so, but it is. I'm not picking on anybody. I don't mean that. I'm talking about people that really don't have a reason to be complaining, but they complain anyways. If you want a reason or excuse, the devil will give you one. Many are weak, many are sickly. Greek 732. And, and sickly means weak. But it also means infirm. Ill. Or invalid. And this is just from this passage. We'll look at diseased and different things later. But many are weak and many are sickly. Weak, infirm, ill, or invalid. Now, many sleep. Now, we got one of, if you are a person that studies the Bible, if you don't want to get mixed up, one of the rules of rightly dividing and studying the Bible is you have to ask yourself about any scripture who's he speaking to? Now, that's something you always ask yourself. A lot of people get mixed up because they get over in the Gospels, which are awesome. I study them every day. But they take words that he was speaking to the Jews, and you're not a Jew. The scribes and Pharisees, you're neither one. They take words that he was speaking to a crowd, and he's speaking off in the future. And it has nothing to do with you today, even though it's the truth of God's Word. But here, if we ask ourselves the question, who is he talking to, and who is he talking about? It's the church, just like this one. Same spirit filled people that had the Word, that believed in Jesus. And he said, many are weak, many are sickly, and many sleep. And to sleep is 2837. It means to slumber. It means to cease. And I didn't make these up or add them. It means be dead. That, that's what it means in the Greek. I, I wrote it down exactly like what it was. No emphasis added. Many sleep. Jesus 2837. Sleep to slumber, to decease, to be dead. And then the mouse dictionary just says to sleep in death. So for this cause, because you have not reverently received what God has done for you in Christ Jesus, many of you are weak, which would be helpless, strengthless, and without energy. You know we're strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Many are sickly, ill, invalids, and many sleep. Simply put, that means die prematurely. Right? Now, as I said earlier, Christians are always saying everything happens for a reason. But again, this isn't the reason that they usually give. Do you remember several, a couple years back I played that, that thing with Dr. Hagen here in the church? He was talking about we're praying for revival. And he said, there's some things coming back to the church that's going to be revived that the church might not want to pray for. But it's going to happen anyways. And he said, there's going to be things judged that are hindered the move of God in the church. One of the examples was, I played it back here. Y'all listen to it if you say He's talking about a move of God. There's a woman that come down that had a lump on her breast. 
and he was ministering healing. And, and, and this lady came down. He never laid hands on her. Didn't even lay hands on her head, much less on her breast. This lady came down for healing, and, and he called three other ladies down, and they laid hands upon her chest. They laid hands on her, and, and he said he never even touched her, so I don't know if he put his hand on the other lady's shoulder or if he just stood there and prayed I wasn't there, but I'm just telling you what he said. And he was doing this revival. Well, there's a guy across the road that was a mocker and a scoffer and all those kind of things about what was going on in the church, and he lived right across the road from the church. He went around telling everybody, and Dr. Hagen didn't hear him. But he went around telling everybody that that preacher at that church and that revival was in there touching women's breasts in the name of the Lord. That's what he told people. Well, he said, I spoke it out by revelation of the Spirit of God. He said, I didn't know anything about it. He said, but at the last meeting, I spoke out by the Spirit of God. There's a man within a stone's throw of this church that he said, thus and so, repeated back what the guy was telling everybody. He said that I touched this lady's breast and he said it's not so. And he said if he does not repent, he'll fall dead on his front porch in one week. He said, I honest to God never thought nothing about it. He said, I, I finished up the meeting. That was the last night or the next night. He said, I finished up the meeting and went on my way. He said, the pastor called me one week later. And he said, you never believe what happened. He said, what happened? He said, what are you talking about? He said, do you remember that guy? He said, did you said that about? And of course, he would jog his memory. He said, yes. He said, he walked down this porch last night. He said, never got to the steps, fell dead on his front porch. No, that's, you know, today, nobody wants to hear anything about that kind of stuff. Now, is every person that dies early in judgment because of sin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The reality of it is, most people miss out on God's best because they don't know what it is. So they can't walk in. But this is another side that we must understand. To know to do good and doeth it not, the Bible says, to him it is a sin. You and I are supposed to be walking in the light that we have. And if we miss it, we ask God to forgive us and get up and go again, right? Those things will be returned to the body. And this was happening in this particular body. 31 says, if you would judge yourself, you should not be judged. You know, as I tell you all the time, we hear all this mess. Don't judge me, don't judge me. You shouldn't be worried about everybody else judging you. You're supposed to be judging yourself. People say God is the judge. The Bible says God is the judge. Judge yourself. That's why I tell people all the time, I'm going to get all of you guys straightened out. Just as soon as I get myself 100% straightened out. So I'll be pretty safe from worrying too much about what you're doing every day. Because i got the rest of my life to examine myself in the light of the Word, listen to the Spirit of God, and work on me. I don't have time to be dabbling in everybody else's sins and how they're missing it. Because i got to be found judging and examining my own self and my own life, right? For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So I won't avoid judgment, even the judgment of God. Judge yourself. When we are judged, we are chastened, correct the discipline of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Thank God. Even those here in the church, we could go deeper, we're not going to. But even here in the church, these that died early, they slept, which is what Christians do. They didn't die and go to hell. They went to heaven, but they went early. Right? Why? For this cause. They did not properly discern the Lord's body. James 5. It is never God's will that any in the church are sick. We have to get this revelation individually and corporately and move back to walking in it. You, me, and everybody you know, we need to be working on it. You face with different sickness and disease. We don't condemn you if you go to the doctor. Never have, never will. Different peoples at different levels of faith. If we need to go to the doctor, we go ourselves. We're not against the doctors. But regardless, never be found not trusting God in the process. Don't go completely dependent upon the world because if you do, you get to a place that they tell you, we can't help you. And then when you follow this plan, I've seen this happen more times than I can count. You follow this plan, I'm just going to trust the doctor, he or she will help me. And then you get to the doctor one day and they look at you and say, there's nothing we can do. And that's your dependency. And that's your source. That's trouble. Won't get off on it. It's a different message I'm studying for. But it's like right now concerning your finances. 
If you have been dependent upon the world's plan and system, you need to change. Because it's not going up. The only thing going up in the world is prices. Mm -hmm. Amen? But God's plan doesn't change. He'll supply regardless. You know, I, I know I ministered on a few weeks ago. But you remember Elijah. Elijah, the prophet, the man of God. He was being taken care of by God by the brook there. <laughs> then by the widow woman. He was being taken care of by God. Fully nourished, fully sustained by God. Food and water. And the king was in fear. Things are turning. We need to be prepared. Trust God. James 5 says, verse 13, Is any sick, excuse me, is any among you afflicted? This is the question. He's talking to the church. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That's a good thing to do. When you are afflicted, pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. <clears throat> is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He said in verse 15, and the prayer for what's to do when there's any sick in the church, whether she or others. Now I understand calling for the elders of the church has been taken out of context. In reality, if you're sick and you're able, you're supposed to pray the prayer of faith for yourself. A lot of people, they just don't even pray for themselves. Call everybody else to come pray for them. I guess in some senses it's fine. But this here, there was an understanding. This is people that were in a situation where they couldn't pray for themselves. So the elders of the church would be called upon to pray the prayer of faith for the sick that couldn't pray for themselves and they'd be raised up regardless. It was not God's will that anybody in the church was sick or afflicted. There was an action plan if they were to get them out of that situation. And the, God, the gospel has a change today. Healthy, wealthy, and wise, Right? The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. If you commit his sins, they'll be forgiven him. So, the prayer of faith is, is to save the sick. The origin of sickness and disease in the life of the believer is the result of sins or sin. James, excuse me, John 5. I think I, I know that I mentioned this last week. And, and I really believe because of my studies and God's direction, we're coming back. But I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to read through this and I may leave you with this tonight. Examine and judge your life. It's important that you're living for God. Both for you to be a vessel to help other people, but even for yourself. It doesn't start with anybody else. It doesn't start with your husband. It doesn't start with your wife. It doesn't start with your children. Don't wait on everybody else to get serious with God. Love all of them. I'm not telling you that. But only you can surrender your life to God. Only you can walk by faith and trust God for you. You start right where you're at. I'm not here to condemn you if you've got sin in your life. Things that you not have been yet, to over, yet able to overcome. Just feed on the Word and your faith will come up. And you'll be able to overcome those things that have overcome you. Sanctification and holiness. It's a process. Nobody arrives instantly. Positionally in Christ, everything is available to you instantly, but it says you feed on the Word and learn the Word and walk it out by faith that you grow in God and grow in Christ and become more like Him daily. Don't be discouraged and frustrated where you're at, absolutely, but don't accept it either. Mm -hmm. Don't accept it. It's something that just throws me today as a minister of the Gospel at 45 years old because I don't consider that that old, but things have changed so drastically even from 15, 20 years ago when I was in church. Things that used to be taken seriously, nobody even cares about it anymore. I don't understand that. You'll have people say that I'm serious with God. Their language is not of God. It's not of faith. It's of the world. It means nothing if they come to church. Tithe, give. Don't care about anybody else. That, that's, that's not the Spirit of Christ. Something's wrong. When you truly get serious with God, nobody has to ask because they'll see change in your life. You start watching your mouth. You don't talk like you used to. No, you know you haven't arrived. I know that. But you don't talk like you used to. I know that you have, but I know that I haven't. You don't talk like you used to. You don't walk like you used to. You don't do the same things you used to. You don't react to problems like you used to. Because there's a work going on inside. 
John 5, 1, at this time, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, there was a, now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market of pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. They were all in a mess, you could say. For an angel went down of a certain season, at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whoso then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto, the, unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? You know, God expects faith from you and me. Then to the man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step it down before me. He had an excuse. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Nine. Immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him, That was cured. It's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he answered them, He that made me whole, the same saith unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which, is, which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away. A multitude being in that place. Verse 14, this is what Jesus said to this guy. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, you are made whole. He had received from Jesus. He had been healed. But Jesus made this statement. And in this situation, not everyone, we'll look at more later. In this particular situation, it was like those at the church at Corinth. This guy was in the situation he was in because of sin. Now I know sin is behind all sickness and disease, but we're breaking it down to two different things. If you have known sin in your life, it will hinder you from walking in God's best. That's unpopular but true. Amen? He said, Jesus said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Now people will say today in the church, just hold on because everything will get better if you just hold on long enough. That's not biblical. It sounds real cute, but it's not true. There's two ways from this very moment tonight your life can go. It can get better or it can get worse. And it will be based upon your decisions. That's involved in every area of your life. People's lives don't get better just because God loves them or you. He said, what is it, 2 Peter 3, 9? God's not willing that any man should perish. But the Bible also says back in Isaiah that hell hath enlarged herself. So the reality of it is the will of God is not automatic. It must be received by faith and there has to be obedience if we're going to receive God's best and His results. It is not automatic. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more. Because if you do, what did he say? Lest the worst thing can come up will come upon you. You see that. While it's not God's will, if you choose to continually disobey God's word, you open the door for the destroyer, which is who? The devil. When you allow him in, what's he going to do? What does he do? He'll destroy it. Personal sins in the life of the believer. And many say today we don't need to talk about these things. That's not true. I love everybody, but I counsel people and endeavor to help people. It's not true. They do need to be talked about. You have victory over sin, and you don't have to live in sin. You do not have to do what the devil wants you to do. You do not have to do what the world wants you to do. And you don't have to do what your own flesh wants you to do. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, we've been given victory over our three enemies. Our three enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we have, been, we have victory over all of them. Right? Personal sins in the life of the believer will always disrupt the will of God for your life and stop you from enjoying God's best. Understand this. We are not talking about you being perfect. There's only a few of those perfect. I don't know if you people think they are. I guess that's between them and God. The ones that I know that think they're perfect, they're the only ones on the earth that think they're perfect. 
yourself, no must be. We're not talking about you being perfect. If that was the case, you would never receive, and neither would I, from God. Nothing. As far as perfect, our definition. We're talking about a life that surrendered to God, and this person may miss it, but they repent when they do, and then what do they do? They get up and walk in the light that they have, right? Your heart belongs to God. But you have people that's just living one way, living for the world, the flesh and the devil, enjoying the Super Bowl party and the halftime show. You say, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, I mean, the Bible says God will forgive you if you repent. I already told you that. Amen? But, but don't be surprised when you go away opposite of God's and then don't walk in His blessings because faith begins where the will of God is known. The will of God being the Word of God. Right? There's not any promise of provision, protection, sustenance, healing or anything outside of God's will. So you have to or get to do what you know to do. And as you obey God, if you're willing and obedient, you'll lead it the good of the land. God's got a good plan for you and me. It's already available now through Jesus. Not one day, but now. We need to learn it and receive it by faith. You say, well, this is negative. No, it's not negative. God wants to show us, number one, the standard in His Word. And number two, if there's anything there, thank God you got a helper. Do you know that? you got the Holy Ghost. If you got stuff in your life that needs changing, needs adjusted and corrected, you're not alone. you got help. You can change and He'll help you. you got the Holy Spirit who lives within you. Greater than see this in you than He that's in this world. So God hasn't just chumped you over to the side and said, yeah, you got this mess in your life. I'm rejecting you. No, He receives you in Christ Jesus. But the reality of it is, although He receives and accepts you, I mean, the Bible tells us to do those things that's pleasing in the sight. Everything's not pleasing to God. And some things the Bible says can quench the Spirit of God and the flow of God's blessings in our lives. But if we'll repent, can we walk in the blessings again? He's merciful. Stand to your feet. He'll forgive us. Thank God for your word. Father, we love you and praise you and glorify you and magnify you. And I just believe by the Spirit of God, He's also the revealer. That the Holy Ghost in my life and everybody's here, He's revealing it in everything. Because see, the bottom line is in line with the word, every person in this place, no matter what they're dealing with, no matter what they've been through, this is not a message to throw them away. This is a message to preach and teach the standard that we're to look at and live by. You'll meet them right where they're at and you'll help them to become who they're called to become. And if they ask you to forgive you, you know, you told Peter and you told us in the Bible over Luke 17, you told him it didn't really, truthfully, it didn't matter how many times that our brother sinned against us. If he repent, we forgave him. Well, you don't tell us to do something that you don't do. So if we miss it and we repent, you forgive us. And we just get up and walk again, feed on the Word, grow strong and overcome all that we face in this life. We just thank you, Father, that this is being revealed by the Spirit of God. Every step that needs to be take, taken, every decision that needs to be made in their life right where they are, and they're rising up and walking in your best in Jesus' name. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you hear you say, Pastor, I don't know if this Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. don't know if I was to die or heaven. <coughs> I want you to pray with me tonight to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. Flip your hand up boldly. I'd be glad to pray with you. Anybody in the place, number two, you say, I know I'm a Christian. I have no doubt. But I've got out of fellowship with God. I want to rededicate my life to Him tonight.